You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome back to Mind Over Murder. This bonus episode is one of three episodes that we originally recorded in 2020 covering the Grim Sleeper case, a long-standing series of unsolved murders in Los Angeles that were later solved using familial DNA. Much of our discussion is based on the book on the Grim Sleeper case by Christine Pelisek, and our three-part bonus series concludes with an interview with Christine Pelisek discussing her book, Grim Sleeper, The Lost Women of South Central, which we highly recommend. We hope you enjoy this bonus episode of Mind Over Murder, and thanks as always for listening. Today, we are happy to bring you a wonderful, interesting interview that we had with Christine Pelisek. Christine Pelisek, if you may recall from our previous two episodes on the Grim Sleeper case, is the LA Weekly reporter who now works for People magazine, who originally broke stories about the Grim Sleeper, including the existence of the task force that was attempting to catch him. She wrote the book, The Grim Sleeper, The Last Women of South Central, And our episode today is the conversation that we had with her about her book and about the case. And we certainly hope that you enjoy listening to it as much as we enjoyed talking to her. Today, we're joined by Christine Pelisek, author of The Grim Sleeper, The Lost Women of South Central. Christine, welcome to Mind Over Murder. We are so thrilled to have you. Oh, no, absolutely. It's an important story, so I'm quite happy to talk about it. So let's go ahead and dive in. And I do want to start by asking, out of all of the cold cases in Los Angeles, what compelled you to get involved with this one in particular? I worked on a lot of cold cases when I worked at the LA Weekly, but this one actually just came out of nowhere. It wasn't a case I knew about. I used to go to the coroner's office in Los Angeles just to look at, just to see if there was any cases that might be something that I might want to write about. And so I used to go there on a regular basis. When I went there one day, I was talking to one of the main guys at the coroner's office, one of the chiefs. He had told me that his office was actually looking into a bunch of deaths that occurred in L.A. County. And a lot of them were these murders that occurred in L.A. County over a period of 2002 to 2006. So he said that there were women, all races, that were found dead in alleyways, dumpsters all over L.A. County, different law enforcement agencies. And he had said that they were putting together like a task force, like a coroner task force to look into to see if any of the cases were related. So that's actually how I started. I didn't know at the time that this case would actually go back to the 80s and it would be a cold case because at the time they were just looking at these cases from 2002 and 2006. And they noticed that there was a lot of women like that were found dead in like dumpsters, alleyways, park. And so they wondered, is there a serial killer? Like what's going on? And I, they didn't have a lot of communication with the local law enforcement. They'd ask law enforcement, the law enforcement would basically be like, we handle the investigation, you handle like the the death side. They wanted to find out more about it because they just thought, wow, there's like a lot of women that, that are that are being found dead in L.A. County. And so he actually told me about it and he wouldn't tell me anything more. Like he wouldn't tell me how many women or anything along those lines. So it took me quite some time before I actually got him to divulge how many women were on this list. Because he had told me that there was a list of women that they had and that they were going to mm-hmm. work on it. And as the time went on, I was asking him, what's going on with it? And he kept blowing me off type thing. And then he finally was frustrated. And he was like, we're busy. Like they were the coroner in LA County is extremely busy. I don't know. It's either the number one, like busiest or next to New York, like one of the two or like the busiest coroner offices in like the country. So they were really busy and the coroner investigators are busy. They're understaffed and all this other stuff. And so he ended up giving me this list and it turned out there was 38 women on the list who died 
And the list had like the woman's name on it, what police division was responsible, whether it was like LAPD or LA County Sheriff and the detective that was handling the case. And so I didn't know anything else besides that. I didn't know how they died, etc. So I ended up like contacting all these different law enforcement agencies to find out how these women died. The coroner at the time, like they thought they were all homicides. As time goes by, there's something else possibly. When I was looking through the list, some of the women had ended up that they were actually suicides. Some of them were accidental deaths, but the bulk of them were all homicides. And I basically just went. I, I just called like every single law enforcement agency to find out whether somebody, whether there was a suspect, etc. So I ended up getting to case number 37, and that was Princess Bertha Mew. And she was a young, like a teenager who was found murdered in Inglewood. The detective, I tried calling him so, so many times, and he blew me off so many times. And finally, he agreed to talk to me. And so when I went to talk to him, he actually told me that her case, her 2002 case, Inglewood case, was linked to a LAPD case in 2003. And that woman's name was Valerie McCorvey. And that those two cases were linked through DNA to a series of murders that happened back in the 80s. And the victims in the 80s were all shot with a 25 caliber pistol. And the two cases in 2002 and 2003, those victims were strangled. But they were able to link through DNA because the LAPD started this cold case unit to these 80s murders. So at first, when I first got involved in this case, I'm sorry I've gone on about it. But the reason is basically I didn't know it was a cold case at first. Was it unusual for the coroner's office to be driving this inquiry? They had, there's all different investigations. Like it turned out that like the LAPD, obviously they knew about it. And so they were doing their own investigation into it. And there was like one detective that was working on the case. And he was the one actually, because when the LAPD started a cold case unit back in like the early 2000s, like he remembered this detective actually worked the streets in South Los Angeles where all these murders were taking place. And he remembered that there was a serial killer Southside Slayer? Slayer. The Southside Slayer. Back at that time, there was like over 100, 200, maybe even 300 murders of women back then. And so at the time, the detectives all thought it was this guy, the Southside Slayer. But it turned out it was six serial killers operating at the same time. But they didn't know at the time. And they arrested a couple of them back in the 80s. But it turned out that this detective was a patrol officer at the time. And so he remembered the cases. So he actually went to look to see if there was any DNA evidence left from the 80s. And so he ended up finding the DNA, putting it in to be tested and all this other stuff. And so they knew about the link. Inglewood knew because Princess Bertha Mew's case was linked, but they didn't tell the coroner and they didn't tell the families or they didn't tell the people in the community. So they didn't know. So it was a secret until that's how I ended up finding out. They ended up telling me, but prior to that, it was no one knew what was going on with the case, like the public anyway. They could not have been too thrilled then when here's this intrepid reporter from the LA Weekly asking all kinds of questions. Did you get pushback? Did they try to get you to sit on the story? And you were beginning to piece together what became your series of very powerful stories for LA Weekly and then ultimately this book. They ended up finding out that there was the 2002 murder, the 2003 murder, and then he struck again in 2007. January 1st, 2007, he killed Janisha Peters. Her body was found in a dumpster in South Los Angeles. The police found out at that point that they found DNA on a garbage bag twist tie, which linked her case to the other cases. So they knew that the serial killer was still operating. At that point, I learned, but I didn't find out for, God, almost a year later or something like that, that I finally found out about it. And so I found out who it was, et cetera, that it was Janisha Peters and that her case was linked. So then I went to the detective and the LAPD with that and the detective he spoke to me and he wanted it to his reasoning for it was that he didn't want the story to go out and he couldn't stop me from putting the story out. But he said he didn't really want me to put the story out because of the fact that he thought that the killer, if there was any publicity on the case, he could go underground kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just felt that, and so did my editor, we both felt that 
like the public needed to know that there was a serial killer out there. Like it needs to be out there. So that's how it that I did the story. And then a couple of weeks later, about a week later, the city council did a reward, like a $500,000 reward looking for information on the killer. And it snowballed from there. And about a year after that's when Bratton, who was the police chief at the time, had a press conference and spoke openly about it. And they were doing regular press conferences at that time. At what point did you and your editor come up with this Grim Sleeper name? Well, that was right after, let's see, that would have been in 2008. That was after I found out that Janisha Peters was killed. My editor was like really interested in naming him. I wasn't really into that. She was because she made a point to say that basically a lot of people, you hear about these serial killers and then nothing else. If they're given like a moniker, you know, people will know and will remember. And I thought it was a good point, too, because everyone remembers like the the Golden State Killer. People remember BTK Killer, Son of Sam, Mm -hmm. things like that. And the Green River Killer and everything like that. And it was like important for me and for her to keep it out there because I just know from investigations and I'm sure you guys too, when it comes to cold cases, they work on it. And then if there's no leads, they put it aside. And they always say that the cases are still open, but Uh we all know that they, Uh unless somebody comes and provides a tip thing. So I didn't want this case to be one of those cases where investigate it for a couple of months and then they move on. I just wanted to make sure that it stayed in the public because the more of a case is published, or out there, the more the police are going to stay on it. That's how it works. Squeaky wheels and all of that. On some level, I was smiling too, because giving a serial killer like this a nickname, if you will, it's a real old school newspapering. They did this for years. I know the LA Weekly wasn't a, a broadsheet like the LA and New York and Chicago papers from the 30s, as a weekly alternative with a pretty strong history of strong journalism, it did harken back to those in-depth articles that you would see in a well-written newspaper back in the day. My editor, Jill Stewart, she's like just a really phenomenal editor and reporter. And she just, she knows what needs to be done in order to get information out there and get people to read the story. It was right. And it made, it made a big flash I was glad that I just wanted it out there. It was just so important to just keep this case out there so they could find this person after 25 years. Did you get a sense then as you began to build the series in the LA Weekly with these in-depth stories, did you begin to see the momentum of the case in terms of resources and even other media attention from your competitors and local television, radio, that kind of thing? Could you see the momentum begin to pick up? I saw the momentum at first. Well, like people were going to press conferences. Like there's the media was at the at first. There was a lot of media coverage of it. When Bratton, for the first time, like he came out a year after my story came out and he called him the grim sleeper kind of thing. And he had a press conference and it was packed in there. CNN, everybody was in there. And he was mm-hmm. talking about there was this one particular they had a phone call and they believe it was actually Lonnie Franklin, the killer who made this call about a body that was found in an alley. And so they actually mm-hmm. played it and they were hoping that somebody could recognize the voice. It was a male voice wow. saying, Oh, there's a body in the alley. And so there was a lot of attention then, but it just waned. And I even spoke to some of the detectives who at first they were, they did definitely did not really want to talk to me very much at all. Like I get like the, the glare when I walked into a room. (laughs) Not a warm greeting. (laughs) Right. But then after a while, they were having these press conferences to bring attention to the case. And I would be there. And sometimes there would only be a couple of us there. And I remember one time it was actually with Michael Jackson when he passed away. And I was pretty much the only person at the press conference. Oh, how strange. uh, I remember that was such a big story. I was living in L.A. at the time. Yeah, it was uh, the family was actually there was like the family. They wanted to walk around because some of the family members were having like press conferences as well. And on this particular occasion, they wanted to go to the neighbor around the neighborhood and like pass out flyers. And so I was there to cover it. And just a lot of the media had left just because of the breaking news of right. Michael Jackson. And I talked to some of the detectives and they had said they weren't getting the press coverage as they once were kind of thing. And so they, I think they were wondering whether 
what was the point of having some press conferences. And they never really thought that they'd be able to catch him because of the press conference. And they also don't like when you have a press conference, you'll get a lot of people calling in with, they had guys calling in saying the killer was like Kramer from Seinfeld and things like that. Useless stuff. Yeah, they had to go through a lot of stuff. They had this big tip thing. But as the time went by, the tips started to, there weren't as many tips as there were, you know, there were, but they had like thousands of tips at one point. At what point did you realize that there is a book in this? I always thought that the story was incredibly fascinating. So I really thought about it from the very beginning that there was a book in it, but I just didn't know whether I had it in me to do it, really. Just from everything I learned from it, from just everybody involved. And there was all like just from the police investigation, it was very interesting. There was a lot of red herrings. There was a lot of suspects. There was this L.A. County sheriff who they believed was the killer for a decade. And it wasn't until years like the 2000s that they realized that the sheriff was actually died of a heart attack in between two of the murders. So (laughs) it clearly wasn't him. It clearly wasn't him. So it was very, there was a lot of twists and turns. It was also a time, it was like a very like tragic time in like LA history. There was like the crack epidemic going on. There was so many drive-by shootings and there were so many murders. And the women's murders, they were just not, I wouldn't say like necessarily neglected, but I think that the detective, and they're also, you have these detectives, they're working in these busy areas in South Los Angeles and you'll have just a handful of detectives working like so many murders. I, I was talking to this one detective and he was telling me how over weekend they'd have like him and his partner would have three murders. So right. you go for one and then go to the next. And like, how are you supposed to really all this investigating and all the you know, like the brass, they weren't giving the resources that these detectives in South Los Angeles needed to do a really thorough job. They wanted to catch the killers, but it's how are you supposed to do a fantastic job when you have three murders that you have to investigate over one weekend? Yeah, and I can imagine unless a case came together relatively quickly with the tragedy of what was going on with the crack epidemic at that point and gangs and, as you said, drive-by shootings, Unless you really got some traction early on in an investigation, it was going to be overtaken by another tragic shooting the next week. Well, and these cases were really difficult. They were, as they're called body dumps. So they were just like dumped in alleyways. So it wasn't like a domestic thing where you can actually go and talk to the husband or talk to the brother or the sister or whoever. These girls were found in like alleyways and dumpsters. There was barely any evidence. And then back then, of course, there's no DNA. So how do you figure it out who it is? And a lot of the girls, sometimes they didn't come home for a few days and they hadn't talked to their families in a while and stuff like that. So it made it like far more difficult. Another interesting thing was when the detective, there was one detective that was really well known and he had covered like the Bonin case, like the serial killer. And uh, so he was really well known with robbery homicide. And he, at the very beginning, believed that all these killings even though some women were like during that period like some women were strangled some were stabbed some were shot like he thought that they were all related you know it wasn't until a couple of years later that they realized that it wasn't one there was a number of killers out there and they were going in the wrong direction for a while there thinking that it was just this one person and also too back in the 70s they didn't have that much experience with serial killers not like today where we all know the profiles and stuff back then like they really didn't know so I just found it a very like fascinating case and then to me also too one of the big things for me was the victims I really wanted with my Mm -hmm. book I really wanted to tell their story because a lot of times people are far more interested in who the killer is but I wanted people to know about who they who these women were and who their families were And that was the part of the book that I found really most admirable is that you kept such a tight focus on the victims and that you really gave these women back their voices and their humanity. And I just can't, I can't say enough wonderful things about that. It was an excellent book. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I really, I spent a lot of time with the families because some cases I was the one who told some of the family members that their daughter was killed by a serial killer. And so I was in contact with them, letting them know like any kind of new development. And then all through the court process, there was like a handful of families that regularly went to Lonnie Franklin's court hearings. That went on for six years. 
could just see like just the pain that they were feeling. And it, even because of the, even though the cases were like 20 something years old, it was just like what happened yesterday. I mean, remember Porter Alexander talking to him and he blamed himself when he was like, if I had done something more, maybe my daughter, because his daughter was 18 years old when she died. And just to see him like this really proud man break down in tears, is just devastating. There are I, stories to be told. Was anyone from LAPD keeping these family members abreast of what was going on with the investigation? They started to. Once the story came out, they started to. They had meetings sometimes at churches and things like that. So they were like once the story broke, they were when the family members were calling a couple of the officers and things like that. And they had this one family gathering and the LAPD, actually, they're the ones that basically with one of the family members, they agreed to have this meeting at this church so they brought a lunch and all the family members were there. They spoke, but it was just actually, it was more of like an interrogation because the families were just not happy whatsoever. And so they were really bringing. How did that go? Yeah, it was, I found out, like I found out, I didn't find out until the night before. And one of the family members actually called me up and said, hey, the LAPD wants us to go to this place. We're going to meet at this church and everything. Will you go? And I was like, oh, because I the cops were just not very happy with me. And I was like, oh, gee. And I was like, yeah, I'll go. And then I called one of the detectives to just let him know that I'd be there. And he, he was not happy about it. But he's like, OK, go. I'm going to ask the families if there's any other families that don't want you there, then you got to go. And I was like, OK. And so I went and then he basically asked everybody in the room. There was like about 25 people in there. If anyone, just one person wants her to leave. We'll ask her to leave. Then, then we'll ask her to leave. And not one person nope. said anything. And they were like, no, we want her to stay. The families had to realize that your journalism is the reason why the LAPD had put time, attention, and resources back into the Grim Sleeper case. There's not much way around it. You have to take some credit there. I don't know. They were definitely involved in the case, but I, I do think that immediate attention definitely helped out the situation for sure. Because I know that as time was going by and they hadn't got a suspect and they were working on it. They, were, they went to Georgia and they ended up, there was this one guy, because there's Cosmopolitan Church was a place of interest where maybe the killer had gone there before and everything. Mm -hmm. so they ended up finding out about the pastors and everything, the pastors. And so they ended up going to Atlanta and into Georgia and they ended up like going in. There was one guy who was buried in a crypt and they ended up going and going in there and taking his femur bone to get his DNA to see if he was linked and everything. And they ended up finding a box. I remember like one of the detectives telling me this. They ended up finding a box with him. And they shook it and they were like, oh, my God, as they thought, could it be the gun, the 25 caliber? And it turned out that it was the pastor was buried with his dog and it was the dog's <laughs> collar oh, that was making the noise. But yeah, like they were, but it was just one of those things where they were trying, they were doing everything. They were looking at every, going to the neighborhoods and trying to do like geographical profile, who's living there now or same, some of the same people living there and all this other stuff. And they were just nothing would, when they'd follow people and they my goodness they must have swabbed like hundreds of people so they were getting really frustrated i noticed as the time was going by there was like six guys and all of a sudden it was four and then there was like three then i was like uh-oh what's going on with this so that's how it happens slowly they move the people around and everything like that so I just wanted to make sure, you know, for me to keep writing stories, I just wanted to make sure that I constantly did stories to keep it out there, to keep the attention out there. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Without implying that the LAPD was doing nothing, because far from it, we know that they did continue to work the case. Certainly, the media spotlight does help to swing back that pendulum. Like you said, terrible things were happening every single weekend. As the brother of a murder victim, I know that media attention makes a tremendous difference in terms of the focus that a case gets. And I've told this to other murder victims' families you're actually competing for a limited amount of law enforcement resources. Yeah, it's true. In terms of thinking, okay, I'm going to write a book about the case. Were you able to take the content that you had written for the LA Weekly and transition it and begin to mold the clay a little bit, thinking I'm going to go more long form here because I think this is an important story? I kept all this stuff. I'm one of these hoarders where I 
investigation. Like anytime I start something, I keep all my information. So I had everything from the moment I started working that case, I kept everything, like every email, every flyer, every number and all that stuff. So I had it. So I had a lot of that stuff. So when I started thinking about it, it was more he gets arrested. And then I was thinking to myself, I really just, I really thought that this book needed it needed to be out there. I thought people needed to know the case and I knew not a lot of people knew about it and I didn't understand why. And so I wanted, I thought it was an important book for people to know. And I wanted people to know who the victims were, et cetera. You know, it was who else is going to write it but me. And I'm the only one who knows. Like, besides <laughs> it, a detective could do it for sure because they would know a lot about the case and the prosecutor would know a lot about the case. But barring those, I would be really the only one to do it, who knew so much about it. So that's right. why I really thought, because I was like, you know what, this really needs, this story really needs to be told. But I just was like, my God, I'm going to tell it? Oh my God, I've never written a book before. <laughs> I was freaked out about it, but I'm so glad. It was like a very long and painful journey. I'm so glad I did it. And I'm so glad that the families were really happy with it. And so that was actually what made me the most happy was that they were happy about it. And so that was really good. Are you still in touch with the victim's families? Is this a relationship that has continued like to this day, even beyond the trial? No, oh, absolutely. I just when Lonnie Franklin recently died and I spoke to pretty much all the family members that day and I spoke to the prosecutor, I spoke to the police, the detectives and everything. And it was really it was like being back there during the trial. Everyone, everyone standing together and everyone talking about it. Because I, I ended up telling some of them didn't know that he had passed away. So I ended up calling them to tell them. Yeah, so I was talking to them and I regularly keep in ton contact with a few of them. I always call Diana Ware, Barbara Ware's stepmother. I always check in with her and the Alexanders. I always check in and Romy Lampkin, her sister, Lucretia Jefferson. So I keep in contact. And Anitria, who's a survivor, her and I. She's amazing. She's... Yeah, she's absolutely amazing. Oh, by the way, at the time of this recording, it's early July 2020, and Lonnie Franklin Jr. died in March 2020, if my memory serves. Have we ever heard any cause of death? Because he died up at San Quentin, and they said they were going to announce a cause of death, and Kristen and I, in our research, still can't find a single article that says how Lonnie Franklin Jr. died. He died of a heart attack. Okay, we figured it was natural causes because they said that it appeared there was no act of violence. Yeah, that's right. He didn't. He had been complaining about on the last couple of days, complaining about like a few things here and there. And they ended up going to a cell. He was in his own cell. And so they went to the cell and found him there and he was unresponsive. There was a few other issues that he had, like he had like heart disease and things like that. And right. I think he was pre-diabetic, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. There was a couple of things that caused it, but it was natural causes. It wasn't any foul play or anything. We didn't think so. We just found it odd that a couple of months had gone by and we didn't see anything in writing that we could find that indicated that they'd announced any kind of cause of death. Yeah, no one ended up writing. It didn't seem like to me that any media kind of picked it up to uh, write about it. But I was very, I wanted to know, of course, so I wanted to find out. And so did everybody else, basically, all the family members and everything. They wanted to know what happened. But we all pretty much assumed that's what it was. I was told pretty much right away that it was not foul play and it wasn't suicide. So we knew it was going to be natural causes. But I was, I was curious as to exactly what it was. Can you talk to us about the transition to deciding to use familial DNA because I found that when I was reading about these steps, you were writing about them and explaining stuff to all of the, your readers, myself included, we'd never even heard of this stuff. So how did that get moved onto your radar? And then how did you find yourself explaining it to the readership of the LA Weekly? I didn't really know anything about familial DNA until <laughs> I was told. Like, obviously, I knew I knew obviously that his DNA was not in the felon data bank, and that's why they weren't able to find it. Like, they had his DNA, his DNA were on his victims, but they didn't have a name to that DNA. So I knew that. So when I ended up like doing that story in 2008, I was told by one of the detectives that they were trying this familial DNA and I had no idea what it was. I had to look it up when I was looking at cases and I, I found a case that it was like a British case. And I think it was one of the first cases where they had this guy who raped a num number of women and they ended up finding him through his sister who had like a DUI in London. 
they found out that those cases were linked. And so then they go and check on him and then they find all these. He was called like the high heel shoe fist or something. It was something along those lines. And so I started looking into it. And I was like, wow, I never even heard of familial DNA. But then I found out soon after that it took a month or so or actually it was a little longer than that, where they had a lot of hopes, like the LAPD, like they had to like basically go to the attorney general and basically ask for this test because it had not been done in California. It had been done in like Colorado. And so it was actually the first time when they, in 2008, when they tried this familial DNA test, it was the first time in the country that it was ever used to try to track down a serial killer. At the time, they had to be very, it had to be a case where like the public was in, in not in fear, but like they were, he, threat to the public. It had to be a case like they had to go through this whole thing right up like a practically a thesis in order to get permission to do it. So they ended up doing it. It takes a long time for them to do that. It was like the Department of Justice. They were the ones that were doing it. And it took them a long time. And they found out it didn't hit on any of the felons in the data bank. But it wasn't until actually a couple of years later, one of the detectives was talking to the woman at the Department of Justice And at that point in time, there was like 400,000 more felons added to the databank. So she was basically like, why don't you try it? Why don't we try it now? It's 400,000 more felons. He was like, yeah, do it. And then lo and behold, it hits on Christopher Franklin, Lonnie Franklin's son. And of course, they didn't know Christopher Franklin was like 28 at the time. So they knew full well that he obviously wasn't the killer. He was too young, but they knew he was related to the killer. And so at that point, they had to figure out who that was. It became obvious pretty quick just because Lonnie, the father, like lived in like the epicenter where all the murders took place. He had lived on like 81st and Western, pretty much where all the killings took place for a couple of decades. After they saw that, they realized that one of the victims, Lucretia Jefferson, lived on the corner of 81st and Western. His house was like four doors in and Lucretia Jefferson lived in this apartment complex on 81st and Western. And then Anitria, when she got attacked, she said that her attacker stopped at this house. It turned out that it was 81st and Western. And it was like she picked the wrong house. It was actually three doors down. She actually was able to take them right back to that neighborhood. So they knew. And then, of course, they ended up following him around for three days. And on the first night, he was married. He's a grandfather, actually, when they caught him. And on the first night, he was out with his uh, girlfriend, driving around and he didn't drop anything say the night at the girlfriend's house and then the next day he went out like trolling the streets looking for girls on the street and they didn't get anything then and it wasn't until the following day that he went with his girlfriend to this pizza restaurant in long beach and the detectives that were following him they ended up pretending this one detective pretended that he was a bus boy and went in and started bussing the plates off the table. And they had a separate section in this bin for Lonnie's dishes. And they ended up taking plates and stuff and they ended up getting a DNA match on a piece of cheese from his pizza. So it was pretty amazing. It really was. You mentioned Initria Washington My interpretation from reading all of your writing and other reporting on the case, it seems like there was a tremendous missed opportunity there. In other words, here she is. I think she's victim number nine, if I'm remembering correctly. And she survives and provided what sounds like a pretty in-depth description of her assailant, what happened, the kind of distinctive little Ford Pinto he was driving, orange with the white stripes. I know there were a lot more Ford Pintos on the street back then than there are now, but it just seemed like with her very vivid memory of what had transpired that night that the police should have been able to put something together because unlike the previous victims, she survived and lived to tell the tale. They did surveillance for about a month on that street looking for this orange pinto and they went knocking on the doors and everything they actually left a card on lonnie franklin's door but of course obviously he didn't call back Uh, (laughs) yeah i'm the guy you're looking for yeah and they didn't follow up they asked neighbors they're asking anyone seen an orange pinto and one woman said she saw an orange pinto nothing really came of it they ended up surveilling that in 24 hours they were at a little store right on 81st western looking for a month And then what happened was this was happening because she was attacked in November of 1988. And they do the surveillance and all this other stuff. And then in February, Ricky Ross gets arrested. He's the deputy sheriff. So I think their entire 
attention completely focused on on Ricky Ross because Ricky Ross was found with a prostitute and she had said that he had threatened her with a gun and that there was a gun in his car. They go and look at his trunk. There's a nine millimeter in his trunk. And there was also besides like the Grim Sleeper murders, which was a 25 caliber, three women that fall just before Anitria was shot. Three other women were shot with a nine millimeter. And so they actually thought that Ricky Ross had something to do with those murders. And then in their investigation, they found that he had a 25 caliber holster. And so they thought and that he had a gun. They never found a 25 caliber gun, but they knew that he owned a 25 caliber gun. So they really fixated on him think that everything else was put aside it was all like ricky ross is responsible and then what happened was with his gun it was rusty and so they like the prosecutors or like the police they end up doing a forensic test on the gun they say yeah it's a match to the bullets in these cases and then his defense attorney they end up doing a test and they're like wait a minute it has they're not even close and so it ended up like they dropped the case and ross was in jail for about 60 days or so and then he ended up filing a lawsuit because he lost his job and all this other stuff but he he ended up suing the city for millions, but he lost. Ended up dying. He lived for years later, but he certainly was under a shroud of suspicion for many years that he was the one who was responsible. There are so many really interesting little diversions, or I guess Bill and I call them rabbit holes, to go down when it, it comes to a case like this. And I found the Ricky Ross one to be particularly interesting. It's one of those truth is stranger than fiction. You couldn't make that up if you tried. Yeah, and there's no way to see why you'd go down that that alleyway. He's got a 25 caliber. He's out picking girls up, and that wasn't yeah. disputed. He was, and he was on crack, and the girl was on crack. It was common and during that time, and some of the victims in the Grim Sleeper case had crack in their system and things like that. I could see why they went down that hole kind of thing. But you're right, though. Anitria, basically, she ended up taking, she picked this house. It was this guy it was an older man who lived there and he was his wife had died and his house had become party house and she had said that whoever attacked her just stopped at the house went in and got a gun it easily could have been that exact house and that Lonnie had hidden the gun because the guy was like older and everything and everyone was saying that everyone like in the neighborhood took advantage of him and a lot of the neighborhood girls would like sleep there and things like that and he was getting like monthly checks and I know that like his family members were worried that people that were hanging around him were like taking his money and stuff like that. It wouldn't shock me if Lonnie had left the gun in that guy's house. And then when he was with Anitria, he decides, you know what, I'm going to kill her. So he pulls up, just hold on, I'll be right back. And then goes in there, grabs the gun. And then because he shot her just around the corner, he drove like less than a block and then shot her. And I was really interested to note that in the penalty phase of the trial, they brought forward another survivor, Laura Moore. Just when you think it can't get any worse and the list of victims can't get any longer, then you have another person who survived. And when I watched the uh, documentary by Nick Broomfield, he found another set of women who had survived run-ins with Lonnie Franklin Jr. I just couldn't believe the vast number of victims. And then, of course, the German woman who he was 19 when he went to Germany. He basically was got in trouble there for him and two of his army pals went out driving one night and grabbed one girl, tried to drag her into their car and she fought them off. And then they drove off because some guy who was heard her screaming comes to the window and yells at them. And so they jump back in the car and drive off. And it was like Lonnie, I think, was like 19 or 20 at the time. And the other guys were like 22, 23. So they keep driving around looking for somebody to attack. And then they pull up to this one woman who's standing at a a bus stop just outside of the train station. And they're like, hey, do you need a ride? She was like, sure. And so she ended up getting in. And then they took her off. They took her to this field. And then the three of them raped her. And uh, she ended up. It it was one of the most bizarre things because she was talking to, she said out of all the three, Lonnie was the less violent. She said that she had to strike up a rapport because she was afraid that if she didn't go along with it, with anything, she'd get killed because one of the guys had a knife and put a knife up against her and everything like that. So she ended up like being more friendly with Lonnie and he asked her for her number. And so she gave it to him and then he called her to go out on a date. Yeah, I thought that was very weird. Uh, yeah, just so completely bizarre how he ended up getting caught and he basically shows up she's supposed to meet him and then of course the cops are there and jump on him and that whole thing he completely i didn't do it and all this other stuff but he got like the other guys got more severe sentences than he did 
you know, he didn't get it as these other two guys got dishonorable discharges, but he did not. Of course, when he got back to stateside, he was able to get a job with L.A. County, the sanitation department, which he probably would not have been able to get if he had that dishonorable discharge. He was able to go back. He got married. As far as that, he got back, and I think I believe it was around 1978. I don't think that they know of any attack. The first known attack was 1984. So he may have been back for who knows. He might have attacked other women. They never found them. But the ones that they know of, the first one happened in 1984. Well, without challenging your naming him the Grim Sleeper, I have a theory, and Kristen can agree or disagree here, that Lonnie Franklin Jr. did not stop for that 13, 14-year period. I think that he shifted his M.O. slightly and stopped just dumping the women's bodies in South Central, and particularly when he was working for the sanitation department, I think he figured out a way to kill women and move their bodies into the waste stream at the sanitation department. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised. They narrowed down. The, they narrowed it down. Like at once, it was thirteen years, and they've since narrowed it down to nine years. Mm-hmm. They found mm-hmm. other women, but also too, he was his children would have been like teenagers at that time. Right. They might have right. wondered like. What are you doing leaving the house at two o'clock in the morning? I mean, you know, yeah. maybe mm-hmm. not. But I also think, yeah, I think he got better at hiding the women. I don't think he stopped at all. And some of the, if you ask some of the detectives, they think they know of 15 murders, but they think it's probably more like 30. And so I, and also too, I think that he also, he had a series of girlfriends like throughout his years, like when he was married. And I think that there was times when he was happy and it was, I think it was very similar to the Green River Killer in that regard. It's like when he was happy, he didn't kill. When he was agitated, he did. Right. So I think that there was different times when he was happy, so he didn't. And then he just start again when he was upset over something. And that was the case, same case with some of the other serial killers in the 80s, too, like Chester Turner. He would get mad at his girlfriend and he didn't want to kill his girlfriend. So he'd go out and smoke kill someone else somebody and right. kill somebody else. Other people stopped and started, and it's funny, Kristen and I have gotten to know some FBI profilers, both through my sister's case and then through our interview process, and a number of them have said that the thinking about serial killers has shifted over the years because now they're realizing that people do stop and start for a variety of reasons, oftentimes having to do with what's going on in their lives. Absolutely, absolutely. There was one case here, John Floyd Thomas, and he attack some elderly white women it ended up that he got a job with the state insurance commission and that's what made him stop he really liked his job and he stopped at that point and he wasn't because sometimes they get older and they stop he just he liked where his life was and that's how he stopped so it really depends on there's not one way that it goes right they all change and for whatever reason like the golden state killer there was like a five-year gap you know, his very last victim was Janelle Cruz. And five years before that, like he hadn't killed in five years until Janelle Cruz. And I was like, why? And then he stopped. He stopped in 1986. He went from 75 to 1986 and then just stopped. And it can be a variety of, of things. They tell us it's relationships, being happy, having children, a di- as you mentioned, a different job, getting religion, believe it or not. So there can be a variety of different things that would have somebody step back. And as you also mentioned, Christine, sometimes they age out of the demographic of the kind of man, in most examples we're talking about, that would commit this kind of crime. Absolutely. All these guys, everyone's different. They have the reasons. Speaking of, how does a a nice young woman from Ottawa end up in Los Angeles cover true crime for all of these years? She originally came here for vacation, but then ended up getting a job with the LA Weekly. And I was actually covering just regular everyday stuff when one of my editors, actually, Joe Donnelly, he asked me to look into this case in Redlands, California. It was this young girl, 17-year-old girl who was murdered by her best friends, and her body was found in an orange grove. And I ended up going out there, and I ended up talking to the police, and I ended up having a really great interviews with the police. I ended up getting like the homicide book. That's basically the investigative book on the murder. I really, I found it very fascinating and just how they ended up solving the case. And so I just really got into that. From that point on, I just kind of went from covering protests and covering city council meetings and things like that, restaurants and everything to pretty much just covering like cold cases and things like that. And like at Daily Weekly, you write really long form right. story. More feature, mm-hmm. feature stuff, right? 
Yeah, and the bulk of the stories I wrote were like these cold cases and it was like families looking for answers and things like that. And some of these cold cases where finally after 30 years, they finally get a DNA hit and arrest somebody type thing. Yeah. So from there, I just kept on doing it. So do you have another project that you're thinking of working on, another true crime project? I'm still not another over book this project. I, there's so many. I don't know. I have to. I'm thinking about stuff, but I don't know at this point in time. There's so much going on with the pandemic and all that. But yeah, one of these days I'll probably. There's a lot of cases that I've seen over the years that are really interesting and really need attention. So those are the cases that I really like to focus on, ones that need the public's attention, you know, because as you guys know, there's just so many cases out there and it's just no one, there's nothing being done. And so the best thing to do is to get that little bit of attention on it. So if if I do one, I'm going to look for cases where it's a case that needs the attention and I could bring, hopefully shed some light on it. It's very much appreciated by all of us at Mind Over Murder. So Christine Pelasek, thank you so much for joining us. The book is The Grim Sleeper, The Lost Women of South Central by Christine Pelasek. We cannot thank you enough for joining us. Oh, absolutely. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. We love the book and we are so looking forward to your next project, whatever that might be. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Sources used in this week's episode include reporting from Nick Broomfield in Tales of the Grim Sleeper, an HBO documentary, Christine Pelisek reporting in the LA Weekly, also Christine Pelisek in her book, The Grim Sleeper, The Lost Women of South Central, Holly Silverman of CNN.com, and Suzanne Zappello of Rolling Stone magazine. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.